Bring forth the raisins and the nuts. Tonight all hallow spectre struts along the moonlit way. No time for this, for tear or sob, or other woes our joy to rob, but time for Pippin and for Bob and Jack o' Lantern Gay. Come forth, ye lass and trousered kid, from prisoned mischief raise the lid and lift it good and high. Leave grave old wisdom in the lurch, set folly forth on lofty perch, nor fear the awesome rod of birch when dawn illumes the sky. Tis night for revel set apart, to re that darkened heart and rout the hosts of dole. Tis the night when goblin, elf, and fay come dancing in their best array to prank and royster on the way and ease the troubled soul. The ghost of all things past parade, emerging from the mist and shade that hid them from our gaze. And full of song and ringing mirth, in one glad moment of rebirth, again they walk the ways of earth as in the ancient days. And beeson light shines on the hill, and willow wisps the forest fill with flashes filched from noon. And witches on their broomsticks spry speed here and yonder in the sky and lift their strident voices high unto the hunter's moon. The air resounds with tuneful notes from myriads of straining throats all hail the folly queen. So join the swelling choral throng, forget your sorrows and your wrong in one glad hour of joyous song to honour Halloween. Woo! That was a poem by John Kendrick Bringles. <laughs> J.K. Bangs. John Kendrick bangs. He bangs, he bangs. Oh, baby. He moves. He moves. Very good. Uh, thank you very much for that poetry recital, Kieran. Welcome, one and all, and let me tell you a tale of gods and goblins. That's a creaky door. <laughs> My God. Was that a creaky door? Yeah. And what's behind it? Is it prizes? This is a podcast exploring the bizarre and beautiful mythology, folklore, and fairy tales of the United Kingdom. We will share tales of fearsome giants, valiant heroes, witches and wizards, ghosts and ghouls, and fantastical flora and fauna. But in today's episode... We will discuss none of those. Pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> Because today we'll be talking about all of the customs and traditions that surround Samhain, Halloween, All Hallows' Eve, All Saints' Day, that whole spooky season of old. Because, of course, this year, a little bit of a washout, Halloween party-wise, but looking back in history, there have been so many different options, so many different ways that people celebrated the oncoming of winter, and we're going to tell you about some of them. But first... Who sat sitting across from me, with sparkling eye and joyous tooth? Why, it's Heather Morehouse. <gasps> Hello, oh. it's me. I'm Heather Morehouse, and I'm here. And what more can we ask for? <laughs> <laughs> oh, very good. And who's that crouched ahead of me on his haunches? I don't know, but we should make him leave. He's... It's Kieran Hill. Oh, God. It's you. No. <laughs> Not again. I'm back. I've taken him out of his box for his fortnightly trip to the microphone. They're moving so big. So how have you been, Kieran? How how have you been? Tell me. I have been very well. Getting ready for, for Halloween, for Mischief Night. I've been uh, painting all our doors with treacle. I've been hiding the cats in, in, in boxes. I, I killed a neighbour. And then wrapped them in toilet paper. tee hee hee That's the one. <laughs> Mischief Night. It'll be a lot less funny when people find that in the news. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> I'm good. I'm good, thank you. Um, What's your favourite thing about Halloween, Heather? The pumpkins. I just love things with tea lights in them. Heather Morehouse, lover of a controlled flame. I do. You know what? I am. We have indeed been continuing our Halloween watch along. We have. A little bit patchy towards the end, but um, we've had quite a bit of work to do getting this episode ready. What's been your fave, Mouse? You know what I really enjoyed? In Fabric. In Fabric is a fantastic movie. I thought that was fabulous. Peter Strickland has now done one of my favourites and one of my least favourites in the list, so he's really redeemed himself <laughs> with this one. I thought Barbarian Sound Studio was quite boring. But In Fabric is great. Properly weird. My, my favourite mm -hmm. is Don't Look Now. Of course. 
because you're mildly in love with what's his face? You mean Donald Sutherland? That must be it. What is it about him? The hair and moustache. The piercing eyes. And the stilted, authoritarian tone of his voice. I'm not entirely convinced he's actually a good actor. No, I'm not convinced either, but he's he cuts quite a figure yes. and he speaks very loudly. Yes. Which is realistically all I ever aspire to in I was, life. <laughs> I was about to say, just starting to realise why I've chosen you as my life partner. <laughs> what are we doing today, Heather? Or rather, what's in the almanac? I'd like to periodically talk about different customs focused around important days in the year. This is, I guess, the first of those. And why not call it episode one of the Gods and Goblins Almanac? I like this. How fabulous. So we've gone into all different kinds of traditions around the end of October, early November. And let me tell you, you are going to come away with more ideas of things to do with an apple than you thought was possibly, possibly possible. So that, dear listeners, is a good reason to keep listening. Bake them. That's one. Don't give it all away. (laughs) So I think it's fair to say that these days, it's generally considered that October, the entirety of it, is the spooky season. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like a little bit of a neologism. But, in fact, October has been spooky season for a surprisingly long time. Or at least it is noted that it is the point when darkness is returning to the world after the abundance and joy of summer. In Anglo-Saxon and Old English, the name for the month of October was... A winter filleth, meaning winter full moon, because the winter half of the year began on the first full moon of that month. Winter filleth, by the way, also a fantastic atmospheric dark uh, black metal band. Oh, almost every name of anything that's going to come up in this episode is probably the name of a metal band. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you're quite right. Just a plug there for winter filleth. If you like Panopticon. Or walls in the throne room. Oh, bit of that. Yeah. Very nice. So even those Anglo-Saxons acknowledge that this was the time in which the golden light of harvest season has passed and winter was on the way. But that's nowhere near as alarming as what happens on the 10th of October. Tell us more, Kieran. October the 10th should probably be better remembered, really, given that it's the day the devil fell to earth. Good heavens. Right. That is spooky. Quite quite an important moment, I think. Spooky season on what? It is said that upon landing, Old Scratch crashed into a blackberry bush. Nightmare. And upon getting up, vented his frustration by urinating all over said bush. <laughs> We've all been there. <laughs> <laughs> Haven't we both? <laughs> I mean, I've fallen in nettles a few times whilst trying to wee in woodland. I suppose technically I have weed on them in frustration, it, even though it really went the wrong way around. It, it, it bears noting at this juncture that you are the most accident-prone person I've ever met. <laughs> They're never significant accidents. They're constant, though. But, but they are <laughs> constant. Yes, it's, it's true. <laughs> um, what's my current injury? I should think I'm okay at the moment. You literally burnt your hand two days ago. I by, did. Due to just looking at a sign while, bo- while pouring boiling water. Genuinely, this episode is slightly delayed in recording because I couldn't type one evening because when I was at work, I was using one of those infinite hot water machines. You know the ones. They're great. I I wish people could see the hand gestures you're doing right now. I'm really acting it out. It has a little tap that kind of locks into place and I was filling up my pint of tea and I, because it takes a while to fill it up, you know what I mean? There's quite (laughs) a lot of water in there. I I became distracted and started looking, looking at the notice board. And uh, as I was looking and turning, my hand was clearly coming with me. And I was just (laughs) holding my hand underneath the boiling hot water. took me a second to kind of realise what was happening. And by the time I had, my hand was horribly scalded. (laughs) But I was still like, whoa, I can't drop my tea. So I I, I put it down on the side and, and fished my tea bag out. My hand was terribly scalded. It was very painful. But now it's fine. Everything's fine. Right. Um, currently, I am not injured in any way other than a little bit of scarring on my hand. How is your knee? My knee is fine. I had a little bit of a fall over a couple of weeks ago. I have fallen over in the street more times than is reasonable for an adult. You once fell over a door. I did. I genuinely think I actually fractured my knee at that point, but I didn't go to the doctors, I know. Which was an odd decision. 
I just don't trust experts. <laughs> I'm joking. Okay. Moving on, moving on, moving on. No one needs to know more about my hilarious antics. Or we could just save them for another episode. Well, that, that'll be a bonus. Yeah. Yeah, if we ever set up a Patreon, I'll just <laughs> list all of the various ways in which I've hurt myself or fallen over. Close five dollars or more to hear the time that Heather fell over in a, in a latrine. Take it away, champ. <laughs> <laughs> This is said to be the reason that blackberry eating season ends on the 10th of October. Oh, is it not just because they're a bit gammy after that? Uh, yes, I, this, this, this very much falls within like the first frost, essentially. Yeah. And blackberries aren't frost resistant. Certainly not. Far too watery. October 10th also coincides with the old date of Michaelmas, until the date was changed in the 18th century to come in line with the European Gregorian calendar. Michaelmas was moved to the 29th of September to be close in line with the autumn equinox and marks the end of the harvest festival season. This was a time of change and reorganisation, when stocks would be checked and debts paid, hiring fairs would take place, and slap-up goose dinners would be eaten. However, it also marks a point in the year where darkness was in its ascendancy, hence why the day is dedicated to St. Michael, aka Michael, as in Michael Mass, who did battle with the forces of evil and was the one to actually eject Satan from heaven. And lead him careening into a blackberry bush. Indeedy. Which is where we pick up again. On this date, October 10th, he turns up in England and storms, and storms around cursing berries, spitting on them, stamping on them, and breathing fire all over them. As such, picking and eating blackberries after the 10th will result in death and misfortune. One Sussex legend comes to us in the warning that should children go out and pick nuts, or go nutting... On a Sunday, the devil would appear to hold down the branches for them. Now... Well, that's... He's being nice. He's helping them get their nuts. Swear to God. <laughs> he, it, maybe it would be nice if it was God doing it, but the devil's doing it to trick you. He, but they're still nuts. I, I, I think you're really only seeing the short term of this. I want the nuts. I know you do. <laughs> <laughs> I actually don't really like nuts. I know. It's bizarre. I don't like the texture. It makes my mouth go all gloopy. Now... There are two potential reasons for the creation of this myth. One is it is a way to stop children from getting their Sunday best dirty. You know, don't go out into the woods, the devil will get you. It means you don't have to do washing for another week. However, it is just as likely, if not more so, that it was meant to serve as a warning for wayward youngsters to not head off into the woods with their lovers to engage in acts of premarital rumpy pumpy. These premarital coital acts <laughs> were commonly known Going nutting. <laughs> nut. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> you mean to nut? Yep. I mean, you don't want to be in the woods going nutting and the devil's there pissing on brambles next to you. That would really ruin the mood. Well, that's some serious mischief to be getting up to. Mischief ever? Yeah. Was that a segue? I think it might have been. Following from the tenth. It's a bit of a dry spell in terms of spookiness. It's time to get get your, your pumpkin spice lattes, which are a thing in England as well now. Who knew? They're incredibly sweet and quite awful. I love them. In that period, you kind of have to make your own fun. There are, of course, a few saint days, but they're not very interesting. So... We would recommend doing a 31 for 31. It's quite, quite enjoyable. Yes, it, it gets to a point where you're like, I have seen more films than I need to. Oh, yes. But I don't think any fun is truly fun unless it's a little bit exhausting and awful. That is the most new statement I've ever heard. Yes. <laughs> Tell me about what I could possibly do on the 30th of October. One night before Halloween? Mmm. Well. If I'm looking to maximise my season, my season of spookiness. Well, the last stop before Halloween itself emanates from our northern brothers and sisters. Primarily taking place in Yorkshire and Liverpool, though having spread across the north and down into the Midlands. Some call it Devil's Night. Devil's Night? Some call it Gate Night. Oh. Some call it Goosey Night. Moving Night. Mat Night. Miggy Night. Cabbage Night. Oh, I like that one. <laughs> That's my favourite as well. I just love brassicas. But it's most commonly known as Mischief Night. Oh. Isn't there a film called Mischief Night? There certainly is. There's is a couple. It? Its origins are somewhat murky, but it bears more than a passing resemblance to celebrations such as Saturnalia mm. or the Wild Hunt celebrations of Germany. 
Christmas. Saturnalia, of course, being the Roman wintertime festival. Uh, very close in time period to Christmas these days and involved lots of tomfoolery. Lords would serve the servants, lots of dancing and japing and just having a pretty wild time. Yes, indeedy. Mischief Night is a night where young folk of the area are given more or less a free pass to perform pranks upon the community. These days... This I don't like pranks. No, I don't either. I think it comes from being a lifelong receiver of bullying. <laughs> yes. Yes, it's not so fun when you're on the end when you're on the wrong end of it. No, no. Mm. Did you ever like go toilet papering people's houses on Halloween? I think I got <clears throat> egged into egging a house once. With who? I threw a singular egg. Oh, this was in like primary school, uh, junior school rather. Um I threw one egg and felt so much remorse that I think I just went home afterwards. Was it just over waste of an egg? Probably, yes. I just I don't believe in wasting eggs. I know you don't. Eggs are a high value item. Not a high price, but high value. They were given to us by lovely chickens and we should respect them. Did you ever do pranks on Miss Chief Knight? No. No. I grew up in a village of five children. Right, so if anyone caught the kids up to no good, you'd be just taken out back and shot. Effectively, yeah. <laughs> like, there's very little mischief you can do when everyone knows who you are. Yeah, yeah, that's true. So definitely not free reign being given at that point in time. No. These days, pranks seem to be mostly throwing eggs at passing cars, throwing eggs at other people's houses, throwing eggs at other people, and just various oological japes. That was a seamless insertion of the word oological into a sentence Thank there. You. Back in the day, though, the pranks were a little more elaborate. In his book, Yorkshire Notes and Queries, Joseph Horsefall Turner. You know, most surnames are supposed to be sort of descriptive, older surnames. You know, ah! someone's called Farrier because they're a Farrier. Someone's called Cooper because they're a Cooper. He's um, he someone... fell off his horse. Yeah, yes. <laughs> either he's someone who fell off his horse or he just makes horses fall down. <laughs> Horse scarer. <laughs> yeah. Like an evil version of a horse whisperer. Exactly. Get right up to the horse. You're going to die and you're really stupid and you've got four legs, which is worse than having two. You're going to be glue. <laughs> Joseph Horsefall Turner describes some of the more traditional pranks. And thankfully, we've actually got a Yorkshireman in to read for us. Doors are taken from their jimmers and carried off into someone's outhouse or into the waters of some mill dam. Donkeys are led into some field at a distance, or they are taken and tied to the outside of some queer-tempered man's door. Then again, some old maid's door will be slyly fastened by tying tightly across the door jams, and in the front of and to the side of the sneck, of the sneck, a piece of wood to prevent her coming out of doors till released by some kindly stranger. That's my Yorkshire accent. <laughs> we, would, we would love to keep our resident Yorkshireman alive, but he's just gone through our cupboards, stolen all our bovril, and taken off on his whippet. So he's going to have to be destroyed. <laughs> what? So, following mischief night, the sun goes down, the moon comes up. I turn into a teenage goo goo muck. And quite appropriately, you should too, for we have reached the day itself Halloween. Hurry up, it's Halloween, Halloween, Halloween. Hurry up, it's Halloween, Silver Shamrock. That was good. So, Heather, what's so special about the 31st of October? Nothing. Oh, well, this has all been a Good night, folks! <laughs> <laughs> Halloween, I would argue, has had quite a resurgence in popularity in Britain in recent years, with us sort of re-inheriting it from North America. From such trusted sources as my mum, in the 70s, nobody really did Halloween, and also such sources as my granny, they didn't really do it in the 50s or 60s either. So that's evidence enough for me. However, in the Highlands of Scotland during the early 19th century, the night was regarded as the most important occasion for family celebrations in the entire year. Even more than Christmas. Can you fathom it? I cannot fathom it. Also in Ireland, the Eve of All Hallows was a time for communal eating, for socialising, for hosting parties with friends and family. Oh. I know, right? <laughs> Why did you leave that in? Oh. And candles would be lit for the dearly departed. Many of the customs surrounding this event draw from both a Christian festival for the dead, as well as from earlier pagan winter festivities that involve charms, divination, and appeals to deities of the natural world. A surprising amount of these customs have continued through in some way or another into modern Halloween traditions. 
One that has seemingly been kind of forgotten, however. Nutcrack Night. Nutcrack Night. Cracking them nuts. We're talking about nuts again. We are. So, as I just mentioned, the Eve of All Hallows is a time for feasting and celebration, and what more delicious a feast could one hope for than all the nuts and apples than you can handle? I don't know why you say that so derisively. That sounds like a lovely little snack. In The Life and Times of Harvey, the famous conjurer of Dublin, well, I've never heard of him, so he can't be that famous, which was cited by John Brand in Observations on the Popular Antiquities of Great Britain, there is a letter... Uh, 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 uh. What's its actual title? Observations on the Popular Antiquities of Great Britain, chiefly illustrating the origin of our vulgar and provincial customs, ceremonies and superstitions. Vulgar is a term I've noticed comes up a lot in this kind of turn of the century and earlier writing. I think mean simply more like... Uh, Primitive. Yeah. I don't, I don't think it necessarily carried the connotation, but it does now. I think it, kind of did no, I think it probably did. <laughs> uh, there was a letter dated the 31st of October, 1728, that goes as follows. This is the last day of October, and the birth of this packet is partly owing to the affair of this night. I am alone, but the servants, having demanded apples, ale, and nuts, I took the opportunity of running back my own annals of All Hallows' Eve. This eve will produce some things curious, admirable, and diverting. So people were having fun with nuts and apples all the way back. In the 18th century. That should be the subtitle of the episode, by the way. Fun with nuts and apples. <laughs> These nuts had a purpose, too. Nobody just eats nuts for fun. That's not true! The ale might be for fun. The ale is definitely for fun. But the nuts are needed for a remarkably consistent and quite cosy ritual for telling the future, involving gathering around the fire with freshly harvested nuts in tow. I personally first came across Nutcrack Night in a glossary of words used in the neighbourhood of Whitby. And Whitby should particularly be mentioned because that's where they have the spooky weekender, isn't it? The Goth Weekender. Yeah. It's a spooky place. I've always kind of wanted to go. Yeah. Is it because Whitby is the setting for, like, it turns up in Dracula or something? I think that's it, yes. Ooh, that's probably wrong. I'm sure a Goth listener can tell us. Anywho, this... Glossary of words used in the neighbourhood of Whitby was by Francis Kildale Robinson and is one of those marvellous books of local phrases that I very much enjoy. This is possibly your biggest takeaway from this podcast so far is how much you love these, yeah. Books of provincialisms, they're so fun, I love them so much. Local phrases and how weird they all are, old slang, oh, it's so much fun. It does also, it shines a light on local folklore a lot of the time as well. Yeah, it really does. And, yeah, you really get a feel for kind of how people were speaking and how people were thinking at a certain period in time when they were gathered. Um, They're actually really useful repositories of information. He described Nutcrack Night as follows. In addition to the love feast, which isn't really given much explanation, (laughs) love divinations are practised by the young folks who throw whole nuts in couples into the fire. If they burn quietly together, a happy marriage is prognosticated. But if they bounce and fly asunder, the sign is unpropitious. Unpropitious. Bad. (laughs) The custom was very similar in Scotland, where nuts were put into the fire and named after particular lads and lasses. So you could even judge the future relationship of your friends or enemies. It is to be noted that in Ireland, when the young women would know if their lovers are faithful, they put three nuts upon the bars of the grates. Three nuts this time. That's how many nuts they could handle. Naming the nuts after the lovers so they could choose between two potential boys. If the nut cracks or jumps, the lover will prove unfaithful. If it begins to blaze or burn, he has regard for the person making the trial. If the nuts, named after the girls and her lover, burn together, they will be married. That featured in the Everyday Book by William Hone. The custom has been put to verse, too. The following passage appears in the poem The Spell, that forms part of John Gay's collection of pastoral poems known as The Shepherd's Week, published in 1714. Two hazelnuts I threw into the flame, and to each nut I gave a sweetheart's name. This with the loudest bounce me saw amazed, that in a flame of brightest colour blazed. As blazed the nut, so may thy passion grow, for twas thy nut that did so brightly glow. Aw, that's lovely. I'm glad that he did well. 
So that's all about these nuts. What about these apples? <laughs> Bobbing for apples is a Halloween party activity that continues to this very day, I assume. It absolutely does. I mean, it certainly happened when we were kids. For anyone who hasn't bobbed for an apple, let me paint the scene for you. It involves dunking one's head in a bucket of water and trying to bite into one of the apples floating in there. You throw your head back in victory, apples still grasped in your teeth, while vampire face paint so expertly applied by your mum only 45 minutes earlier disintegrates and runs down your cheeks into your eyes and mouth. That sounded like it got quite personal towards the end there. I like bobbing for apples. It's a historically fun thing to do. It goes way back, and our forebears knew how to party with apples. As a bit of an aside, since the 90s in Britain, Apple Day has become its own celebration on the 21st of October to mark the apple harvest and to bring attention to our orchards and all the nice things that you can do with an apple. Counterpoint, literally no one's ever heard of that. I've heard of it. Because you've been researching this. I actually already knew about Apple Day. You did not know about yes, Apple I Day. Yes, I do, because I follow the page of the local community orchard. Ah, yes, of course, that's... Well, the less surprising thing you, you said on this episode. <laughs> anyway, I know you're gagging for some apple facts. <laughs> Halloween apple festivities ranged from the simplest, such as at St. Ives in Cornwall, where every child is given a big apple on All Hallows' Eve, or Allen Day, as it's called there. Apparently there were some particularly big red and shiny apples that grew in Cornwall in the old days that they called Allen Apples. So that's pretty straightforward. Give a child an apple. That kid's got an apple. Great time. Some of the traditions that occurred were a little more complex, though, and hazardous. In the north of England, the youths would attach an apple to one end of a hanging beam, at the other end of which was attached a lit candle. They would set the whole thing swinging in a circle, and the participant would lunge at the apple with their hands tied behind their backs, trying to catch the apple in their mouths and avoid getting smacked in the face with a burning candle. That sounds ludicrous. And fantastic, yes, and I want to be a part of it. Saturday <sighs> night, let's do it. Saturday night, I'm gonna burn my face all up. Have an apple. Paul Wheel describes this festivity in The Old English Gentleman. Or catch the elusive apple with a bound, as with its taper it flew whizzing round. <laughs> so oh, just goes to show, they weren't just letting it dangle. It was spinning. Sounds like a party, man. People had to get their kicks somehow, you know? Hey, like, honest, honestly, a lot of the time when you hear about, like, older festivities, they sound a bit like, oh. Wow, Glad, glad we've got the internet now. But that one, really down for that. On Holy Eve, aka Halloween, in Ireland, a concoction known as lamb's wool was consumed. Lamb's mm, wool, you say? Yum. Bit of lamb's wool floating in your water. Mm. Au contraire, it was made <laughs> using bruised roasted apples mixed with ale or milk. Ale, yes, milk, no. Roasted apples in milk kind of sounds like something you'd give to sort of an invalid. I guess the milk is the option for kiddies. Ah, yeah. Or ladies. Milk top, love. <laughs> I'll have a milk wine spritzer. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of which, when the superior ranks would deign to join the commoners in the celebrations, they would substitute the ale for white wine. I, I would quite like to try lamb's wool, actually. I think it sounds pretty nice. Valency, an 18th century surveyor of Irish antiquities, suggested <clears throat> the first day of November was dedicated to the angel presiding over fruits and seeds, and was therefore named La Masse Ubal, that is, it was the day of the apple fruit, and being pronounced Lamasool in Old Irish, the English have corrupted the name to lamb's wool. That said, most of his ideas have been rejected as bollocks and nincompoop these days, but I do quite like that explanation, so I'm including it anyway. Apples are used for some divination practices too. For example, in Nottinghamshire, if a girl had two lovers, again, these ladies. They, they, are, they are getting the pick of them, aren't they? They are playing the field. And good I, for them. I, yep, yeah, I say we support you. Yes. Anyway, so she's got two lovers. I'm trying to think of some old timey names Granville and Bourneville. And she wants to know who. <laughs> was... You're rolling straight on through with this one, aren't you? Granville and Bourneville. I don't know. All right, oh, 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 Lord is God and... Bare bones. Yeah, okay. So she's trying to decide between Lord is God and bare bones. They're both dishy. 
They've both got abs. They're hunks. But which one is going to be more constant to her? Because she is playing the field, but she doesn't want anyone else to play the field. So on All Hallows Eve, she takes two apple pips. Mm -hmm. She sticks one on each cheek face cheek and names one on her left cheek is lord is god and on her right cheek bare bones is bare bones and she goes about her business and waits for one to fall off obviously the one that falls off isn't gonna stick around gosh darn bare bones ruddy hell bare bones you philanderer she i mean she had noticed that bare bones had a wandering eye so it didn't really come as a surprise but nonetheless now she knows that he's been going nothing he just can't get enough of those nuts Never wants to let some apple scraps go to waste in Nottinghamshire. What? The pa- <laughs> what? <laughs> you can't start a sentence like that. The parings, the scraps left over from roasted apples, would be thrown over the left shoulder. And whatever letter the parings most resembled would mark the initial of the first name of the person that you were to marry. Huh. If it just looks like a selection of scraps, then I guess, sorry, you'll have to die alone. You're marrying the bagman. Apples and nuts aren't the only ways that the future was forecasted in the British Isles, oh no. Halloween was the perfect time for a bit of casual magic, and all kinds of vegetables and household items would be utilised. I don't think I've ever seen a bigger smile on your face during this show. I just love vegetables, what can I say? In Scotland, they had a lot of vegetable-related fun, where the young women would be blindfolded and grab cabbages, which would determine the size and figure of their future husbands. All cabbage-shaped. You're going to marry a very round man. And so are you. And so are you. Robert Burns, the national poet of Scotland, described several auguries in his poem Halloween. The first ceremony that he describes is similar to the cabbage party, but gives us greater detail and features a different member of the Brassica family. This is the only reason you've included these, isn't it? Mm. People would go out into the field hand in hand with their eyes shut, and they would each pull up the stalk of kale that they first arrived at. Whether it's being big or little, straight or crooked, is prophetic of the size and shape of the grand object of all their spells, the husband or wife. If any dirt sticks to the roots, that is good fortune. I don't really know what that is symbolic of, but there you go. And the flavour of the heart of the stem, whether sweet or bitter, foretells their temperament. That is slightly more obvious. That's a fun thing to do on Halloween. Well, go out into a field and eat some raw kale. I think they cook it. I think they know their way around a kale store. It stalk. sounds to me very specifically like you go out, pull it up and just take a bite. It does sound a bit like that, doesn't it? Yeah. I think they, they pick it and then they go inside and judge the kale um, in, in, in the candlelight of the homestead. If you don't like cabbages or kale... Then please stop listening. How about lemons? How about that? There's an extract from an old chap book called The Fortune Teller. Chap book? The True Fortune Teller. Sorry, I said it wrong. A chap book is a cheap publication of a few pages um, that would be commonly distributed. Um, they would often be humorous, mirthful, if you will, have a few little passages. They were, they were a good bit of laugh fun. A, a good bit of laugh fun. A good bit of laugh fun. Yep. Okay, so here is a chapter headed to know whether a woman will have the man she wishes. Here's the spell. Get two lemon peels. Wear them all day, one in each pocket. At night, rub the four posts of the bedstead with them. If she is to succeed, the person will appear in her sleep and present her with a couple of lemons. Are these the lemons you were looking for, my love? (laughs) But if not, there is no hope, says the true fortune teller. Was this just a grocer having over-delivered lemons? (laughs) He's just trying to flog these lemons. Did you know that lemons are a sign of love? (laughs) But there's more than one way to find your love, as we've discovered there's bloody loads. But here's another one. (laughs) Throw a lemon at someone. (laughs) A girl may cross her shoes upon her bedroom floor in the shape of a T and say these lines. I cross my shoes in the shape of a T, knowing this (laughs) night. Hoping this night my true love to see, not in his best or worst array, but in the clothes of every day. And then she would have to climb into bed backwards, so it's all creepy like the exorcist, and avoid uttering any other words that day. And then in her dreams, she would see her future lover. She sounds like a way of keeping children quiet. Yeah, do the spell with the shoes and don't speak to me. I'm tired and I've got a lot of tilling to do. And remember, the most important thing is don't say anything to anyone for the rest of the day. 
just play with a lemon and be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> William Henderson, our boy. Which one's he? He did all the stuff about the black dogs. Yes. Anyway, William Henderson shares a practice from Northern England in the Scottish borders where, on all Halloween or New Year's Eve, a border maiden may wash her sock. Was that a broader maiden? Border. From uh, the borders. From not, the borderlands. Was it, was it a larger lady? No. No. <laughs> no, I don't think that those existed in those days. Everyone was very malnourished. And I suppose if you were larger, you were probably quite rich. Therefore, desirable. A border maiden may wash her sark, her sark being her undershirt or shift or chemise, which they would wear underneath their outside clothing, and hang it over a chair to dry, taking care to tell no one what she's all about. If she lies awake long enough, she will see the form of her future spouse enter the room and turn the sark over. But sometimes if you play with fire, you're going to get burned. Playing with magic can have alarming consequences, to clarify what I just meant. We are told of one young girl who, after fulfilling this rite, looked out of bed and saw behind the sark a coffin. It remained visible for some time and then disappeared. The girl rose up in agony and told her family what had occurred. And the next morning, she heard of her lover's death. The Scary, night, huh? I woke up and saw a very clear image of a giant bunny rabbit in the corner of our room. It's Donnie Darko. No, 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 no. It's a much cuter bunny rabbit. Like, 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 like a little um, floppy-eared rabbit. Oh, just a big, like, actual rabbit, not a person-shaped rabbit. Yeah, no, a big actual rabbit. That's cool. Yeah, I get I, that happens a lot. I'm sure I've spoken about it in episodes before. See, that's a nice sleep paralysis demon. It, well, it wasn't sleep paralysis. This is... Just some sort of weird visual hallucination I get when I wake up sometimes. I've had Danny DeVito before. All the fun guys are turning up. Honestly, yeah. Little it, floppy eared rabbits, little Danny DeVito. I, I can close my eyes and open it and it'll still be there. I can look away, look back and it'll still be there. It's only when I turn the light on that it goes away. Oh. Other Halloween charms and spells involved stalks of oats, hemp seeds, the tools used for winnowing corn, barley stacks, wet shirt sleeves and dirty dishes. So literally just anything, anything in their lives that they could see at that moment. Uh, we're going to use uh, wet shirt sleeves to tell the future. Yeah. <laughs> cool. yeah, I mean, some are more symbolically relevant than others, but pretty much anything. If it's Halloween, let's do some divination with it. If your sleeves are wet, a lad you'll get. If your sleeves are dry, alone you'll cry. If it's brown, flush it down. Miles, in his book Christmas in Ritual and Tradition, sounds irrelevant, but he actually speaks quite a bit about Halloween in it, shares some more ghoulish divinations. I know you were thinking, this isn't spooky. I want some spooky business. Well, get bloody ready. Such as in Wales, there was a tradition for the women to gather at the church on the night of the winter calends, which was their term for Halloween or Hallow's Eve, etc., etc., to find out who of the parishioners would die during the year. In Dorston, in Herefordshire, they take it a step further. There was a belief that on All Hallows' Eve at midnight, those who were bold enough to look through the windows would see the church lighted with an unearthly glow and Satan in monk's habit uttering an unholy sermon from the pulpit while calling out the names of those who were to render up their souls. Oh, that, sound, that sounds like some cinema, man. Like, Yeah, yeah that sounds like a scene in quite a lot of the films we've been watching lately. Man, that's a boring. You can just picture Peter Cushing being there, right? Yes. Brilliant. Some of these tales do diverge even further. And zip a zip. A zip a zip. With a bee. With a busy bee. And indeed, there are some areas of Britain where the Halloween japes diverge even further from the norm. Such as in the Scottish Isle of Lewis, where things get a little bit. Wet and wild. Take it away, Kieran. We're getting this one in the form of White Hot Story. The priest had tried to stop you. He always did. But who's going to listen to that mad old fool? At least his church was big enough to hold the ceremony. He'd brought back to the island, if nothing else. And so it was that you stood with your family in the church of St. Mulvaney. You'd brought a peck of malt to add to the brew and watched in quiet anticipation as the air was prepared. As the sun went down and the winds blew louder, Duncan the oldest of the islanders, approached. As the sun went down and the winds blew louder, Duncan, the oldest of the islanders, approached the front of the crowd. He presented a pewter cup, and after taking a few seconds to survey the room, he points at you. This year, it's your turn. 
around you are gasps. Before stepping forward, you take a moment to look around the crowd. Some look happy, but you know how long you've been waiting. Others are furious. Clearly, not everyone thought it should be your year. The storm is howling now as, cup of ale in your hand, you lead a procession of the islanders towards the coast. The other men line up on the shore, torches ablaze, as you take your first tentative step into the water. You brace yourself. It's always colder than you think it is. As you trudge forward, your breath becomes ragged. Your clothes are weighing heavy and the wind is whipping the air from your mouth before you can inhale. But still, you soldier forth. After a while, you find yourself waist deep, and it's time. Struggling against the elements, and with every nerve screaming at you to get back to shore, you hold the cup aloft and shout as loud as you can into the darkness. Show me, I give thee this cup of ale, hoping that thou wilt be so good as to send us plenty of seaware for enriching our ground during the coming year. And with that, you throw the ale into the sea and turn around, the distant lights of the torches drawing closer, and you notice that the storm is calming. The choppy tides are mellowing, and as you reach the shore, the night has become temperate. As you approach, the crowds part, and without looking at them, you walk through back to the church. Duncan is awaiting your return, and gives you the slightest nod, clearly pleased that you've made it back in one piece. You all stand in the church, forming a circle around a large candle, heads bowed for what seems like an eternity. When finally, Duncan holds up two fingers, the candle is snuffed by one of the MacLeod children, and at once, every man and woman make for the fields. Already, a fiddler has struck up a tune, and a mighty roar greets the night sky, and you and your folk dance and sing until dawn, knowing that once again, the island is safe and well fed for another year. Oh, that's so exciting! Yes! So yeah, in the Isle of Lewis, they have a full-on pagan ritual to a god of the sea. They did. I don't know if that's still a tradition. I think they should keep it going, because that is a lot of fun. We should do it on Halloween. Let's wade out into the sea, roll our trouser legs up and start shouting. Yes. Shouting at the ocean. I'll break into a church first and brew up some ale. Good shout. Sounds like a rip-roaring time. It does. Speaking of rip-roaring times... We are we are we are leaving the thirty first and heading, as one often does, into the first of November. It's a classic transition. What happens on the first of November, Heather? I'm going to tell you. Well, the eve of All Hallows has passed, and now it's the real deal—the start of November. November in the British Isles is a dark and gloomy thing indeed. So much so that the Bishop Warburton wrote to a friend in 1749 bemoaning the dark influence that this can have on the soul. He says, The dreadful month of November, when the little wretches hang and drown themselves and the great ones (laughs) sell themselves to the court and the devil. Good Lord. Sounds like Misfits lyrics. In fact, I found another source as well where um, apparently the French are always like, oh, November, that's when the English are off themselves. Ha! 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 Because it's so dismal. Well, the Bishop Warburton was not a fan of November, and he probably wouldn't have been too keen on how our pagan countrymen spent the month either. The Anglo-Saxons called the month of November Blot Monath, or Blood Sacrifice Month. Oh! Yes, partly because it was the month in which the bulk of their cattle would be slaughtered to store for the winter but also due to the religious sacrifices that would take place to their heathen gods. The Venerable Bede, an Anglo-Saxon scholar, wrote in his treatise, The Reckoning of Time, and he, he backs me up on this, that Blood Monath is the month of immolations, for it was in this month that the cattle which were to be slaughtered were dedicated to the gods. Hmm. And though we can't be certain of the exact date that they would have celebrated it, and indeed it may even have been a movable holiday, depending on how early or late winter came, for the inhabitants of early medieval Ireland, New Year's Day has been ascribed the modern date of the 1st of November, which marked the beginning of the winter half of the calendar. This was when they celebrated the Great Festival of Samhain, which began on the night of the 31st of October, as the Celtic day started with the setting of the sun. Stupid way of doing it. (laughs) The day starts when the sun comes up. That is the arbitrary decision that we have ascribed to it, yes. No, because you wake up then. You don't wake up as the sun goes down. Why, there's wolves everywhere. Well, maybe they didn't mark their day by when they wake up. At this time, the forces of the other world were said to visit our world and bring blight to vegetation with their breath, so nothing green would stay alive on the following day. 
Ronald Hutton, in his book Stations of the Sun, which is a very useful text on the folkloric year, writes that at the beginning of wintertime, the cereal harvest would have been long completed and the time of warfare and of trading was at an end. It was therefore the ideal moment for the convention of the year's most important tribal assemblies, and indeed the Faeus of Samhain, the festival of Samhain, at which local kings gathered their people, is a favourite setting for early Irish tales. One of these is the sickbed of Cucullan. Ah, that's a pogue song. Yes, it is. <laughs> In which it's said that the festival of the Ulaid at Samhain lasted a whole week. Samhain itself and the three days before and after. So that means we can keep partying for a good while. No one, sh- no one tells Shane McGowan. <laughs> He's partied enough. He doesn't have any teeth. <laughs> <laughs> So at this time, the festival of Samhain involved great gatherings at which they held meetings, feasted, drank alcohol, and held contests. What sort of contests? Sort of gladiatorial things, I think. A bit of jousting. Pretty heavy used to say, like, who can eat the most food and drink the most alcohol? I think that's probably fundamentally what the contest (laughs) was. The early winter customs that lived on over the centuries in Ireland and the Celtic areas of Britain are likely continuations of aspects of the Samhain feasts. Records are a little murky on exactly what these celebrations would have looked like, but there was definitely a lot of revelry. That, I can assure you of. Which probably means a lot of ale. And there is a suggestion by Patricia Monaghan in the Encyclopedia of Celtic Mythology and Folklore that, quote, once the ale was gone, life returned to normal until the next Samhain. <laughs> and indeed, most tales of drunkenness from the early medieval Celtic era take place on the festival of Samhain. Hmm. So maybe it's no wonder why recollections are a little hazy. <laughs> so it was the party of the year. That's a that's another that's, song. That's a confidence man that's song. Confidence man. And while the feasting would be partly a joyful celebration of nature, the threat of hardship would never be gone entirely. Which is perhaps why divination spells and rituals feature so heavily in Samhain traditions. And while the later records of winter divinations revolve mostly around finding love and marriage, once just staying alive through winter had become a little bit less challenging, (laughs) for the early Celts, trying to look to the future and to appease the nature spirits was likely more of a life or death kind of a question. (laughs) In The Religion of the Ancient Celts, J.A. McCulloch writes... In 1911. (laughs) The Celtic festivals are primarily connected with agricultural and pastoral life. And we find in their rituals traces not only of a religious, but of a magical view of things. Of acts designed to assist the powers of life and growth. And so while deciduous plants are dropping their leaves, the evergreen shrubs, mistletoe, and the last sheaf of corn, the embodiment of the corn spirit that they kept safe over winter, were the symbols of the season. Divination was done by the Druids using the aforementioned apples, nuts, wheat, and corn. But the reason being their symbolic association with the recent harvest. And so using them would predict, hopefully, the following harvest. Okay. And where did the nuts go? Of course, we remember, they went into the fire. Up next, let's talk about Halloween fires. Hey, podcast listener. Heather's going to be taking over for the most part from here. Because I can't read. (laughs) There was a little bit of difficulty happening. So bringing warmth and light into the community was done with the Samhain bonfire, which would traditionally have been lit on a hilltop using the need fire method. What the hell's the need fire method, Heather? It is where a large fire is started by the friction of wood on wood. They create this sort of structure, like an H-shaped structure, Uh have a twizzly stick in the middle that would rub on the main two posts and create a large fire. And it was sort of seen as more uh, pure, I think, because it's created by the friction of wood on wood. So it's like just straight out of nature. And these would be lit when famine or sickness threatened the community. Until relatively recently, in some parts of Scotland, the practice of bringing the flame from the bonfire into the home was observed. And then they realised that there were lots of houses burning down around that time. (laughs) No, no, it was in a controlled way. (laughs) Families would douse the fire in their hearth, and then brands were carried around, and from it, the new fire was lit in each house. That sounds lovely. It does, doesn't it? Cosy, warm. Such a nice little practice as well. Bringing warmth from the main fire into each home. 
And with those new fires, they would bring in the purity of a brand new flame, which had protective and cleansing powers, while negative spirits would be disposed of with the old ashes. Indeed, ashes left over from the Samhain bonfires would be placed in people's shoes as a ward against woe. Say merry hell with your socks. Absolutely. I'd be very... Socks are a relatively recent invention. I... I think that's untrue. <laughs> I have no idea. I immediately regret saying that. I would be so angry if I woke up and you had just dumped a load of ash in my shoes. I think it's only a little sprinkle. I'd still be furious. This flame, very important to the whole proceeding. Also, a fun, warm thing to do. James Fraser, in his book The Golden Bough, describes the celebratory nature of Halloween. Rather than a solemn and gloomy affair, he describes the picturesque features and merry pastimes which rendered it to the gayest night of all the year. It became a family affair when, on the last day of autumn, children gathered ferns, tar barrels, and long thing and long and long things and long thin stalks and everything suitable for a bonfire. These were placed in a heap on some eminence near the house, and in the evening set fire to. And as time passed, there even grew a competitive element to the bonfires. There was one for each house, and it was an object of ambition who should have the biggest. Whole districts were brilliant with bonfires, and their glare across a highland loch formed an exceedingly picturesque scene. Did you ever go to big big bonfire things when you were a kid? No, I wasn't allowed near fire. Because you just wanted to see the world burn, you just jump in it. Burn the witch, mummy! The village bonfire in Chadlington got um, shut down after a kid got hit in the face of a firework. What, that was shut into the bonfire? No, it's like on, on fireworks. Like. Oh, did it like tip over or something? Yeah. Because I have heard about people going to bonfires and then just like chucking rockets into them. Apparently they do that in, in like uh, the, the, the more rebellious kids do that at Lewis Bonfire. I've but never actually been. I don't, want my, I don't want to be burned. But I'm frightened. In North Wales, they got a little bit freaky with it. With the rite of the black sow. Ooh. So when the fires would be dying down or being doused, people would jump over the flames and rush to escape the apparition of the tailless black sow that would be accompanied by a headless lady in white who would take the last to run. Hence the rhyme, Home, home at once, the tailless black sow shall snatch the hindmost. It would probably rhyme if it were in Welsh, as per the original. In some areas of Wales, families would place stones in the fire with their names on it. The person whose stone would be missing the next morning would die within the year. I just not put the stones in. It's tradition. It's divination. It's just what you do. I don't want to know if I'm going to die. It's better to just make peace with it, you know? I don't think it is. I'd much rather not know when I'm going to die. You have to understand that this is the older days. People were dying just left, right and centre. Back to McCulloch. He reckons that the bonfire represented the sun and was intended to strengthen it. But representing the sun, it had all the sun's force. Hence, those who jumped through it were strengthened and purified. The Welsh reference to the hindmost and to the black sow may point to a former human sacrifice, perhaps of anyone who stumbled in jumping through the fire. Wouldn't they just get hideously burned? That can often result in death. November was the month of blood sacrifices for the Celts, too. When their livestock that were highly valuable, would be slain, and food such as fresh black pudding would take place as a sacrament as part of the feasts. Fresh black pudding? There was loads of blood around, so it's the time for having some lovely black pudding. God, I miss black pudding. Remember, of course, in again in the olden days, um, food would be very seasonal. Yes, yes, of course. Controversially, we are both fans of black pudding. It seems to absolutely horrify foreigners. Yes. But it's legit really tasty. It's I, just like a really nice sausage. It's one of the things I miss most about meat. We did find that vegan black sausage. It wasn't very... It just tastes like celery. It did taste like celery. It was odd. 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 Yeah, but it's just like a really lovely spiced, fatty sausage. Spicy, peppery, yeah. Oh, it's super good. Super good. I think it's better as well when people call it black pudding, as we actually call it, Wrong. rather than blood pudding. Yeah. No one calls it blood or pudding. blood sausage. No one calls it that. No. It's black pudding. You've got to always be euphemistic when you're eating meat, I think. I'm just talking about entrails, essentially. Yeah. For those that like to get a little weird with the ceremonial sacrifices, take it in a little bit of a different angle, you could, for example, perambulate the township sunwise, dressed in the skin of a cow. Uh, You could. That took place in the Hebrides at New Year. Slash Samhain. And in order to keep off misfortune, a piece of the hide would be burnt and everyone would sniff the smoke 
And the smoke would be inhaled by each person and animal in the township. I'm sorry, I missed that out. Just make your goat huff a little bit of cow skin. <laughs> that will keep the evils away. So as you can see, it was very much all focused around the end of the harvest season, around bringing fire and warmth into the community, and about hoping that you make it through the winter. What Samhain likely didn't involve for the Celts, contrary to popular belief, was a commemoration of the dead. Oh, really? Yes. Ronald Hutton, again quite a valuable source for this, argues that the earliest documentary sources indicate that Samhain was a harvest festival with no particular ritual connections to the dead, and instead that the date of the 1st of November and the focus on death draws more from the Frankish and Germanic tradition, as well as later Catholic dates of All Saints and All Souls. Hmm. More about those shortly. Nonetheless, these traditions from Celtic Ireland entered the Celtic areas of Britain and became intermingled with one another, Christian and pagan beliefs existing side by side. And while ghosts were a later addition, that's not to say that otherworldly creatures didn't feature in Samhain belief. Ooh. With the deities of the other world bringing blight to the land, the squeals of slaughtered pigs puncturing the peace, the wildest parties of the year taking place, fear and jubilance jostling for space at the forefront of people's minds, Samhain was certainly a time that was out of the ordinary. That sounds exactly like download. It's said that even the quietest townships in the Highlands took part in wild, orgiastic rites on Samhain night. It is a liminal time when the senses are heightened and the veil between worlds is at its thinnest. Supernatural forces are particularly active, and even those without the powers of second sight can see beyond the barrier to the other realm. Endless tales of ghosts, witches, and fairies are linked to this festival. Well, I mean, it's their New Year's shindig too. <laughs> So malicious fairies would be on the prowl, looking for lost wanderers in the dark to steal away to fairyland, and so food or milk would be left out as an appeasement to the fairy folk. For those that did have to go out into the night, they would turn their coats inside out, as we know is a common yes. ward against fairies, or carry some salt or iron on them to ward away the fair folk. It was seen as especially important to stay away from fairy mounds because the supernatural hordes would flow out from them and fly through the night, causing mayhem, attacking or kidnapping those who strayed too close. The Christian equivalent to Samhain, occurring on the 1st of November, may be traced back to the 8th century with Pope Gregory III's oratory for the relics of the holy apostles of all saints, martyrs and confessors who were at rest throughout the world. While under the reign of Charlemagne, the Feast of All Saints became a holy day throughout the Frankish kingdom. It is the Festival of All Saints, or to give its old English name, All Hallows, that gives us the modern name of Halloween, the Eve of All Hallows. Hmm. All Hallows Eve. Did you know that Christopher Lee can trace his lineage back to Charlemagne? I did. Or, or at least the time of Charlemagne. Yes. That's why his very good metal album is called Charlemagne. Yes. It's also not very good. I love him, but... It's great. Mm. Yeah. So, according to Clement A. Miles, back to him, in Christmas in Ritual and Tradition, which was published around the turn of the century, so had some slightly, potentially outdated mm -hmm. ideas in it. All Saints Day, probably, he says, represents an attempt on the part of the church to turn the minds of the faithful away from pagan belief in and tendance of ghosts to the contemplation of the saints and the glory of paradise. The modern view is a little less clear. Indeed, it may have just been a time that made sense. I mean, while the leaves are falling from the trees and the brightness of summer is fading, November does feel like a fitting time to consider and commemorate mortality. And I'm going to go ahead and say that the dark winter days lend themselves to fire and feasts. Do we do we know how much there is of this? I think it's a fairly common book idea that as Christianity crept through Europe, it kind of perverted traditional pagan holidays. Yeah. Do we know how much of that is actually true and how much of it is just things happen to coincide? I think it's a bit of a mixture. Okay. So yeah, based on this, I would say when it comes to the Christian festival coinciding with the pagan one, I think the dates ending up the same is more coincidental, particularly when you consider that 
Samhain probably didn't actually fall on the 1st of November. That's okay. just the date that's been ascribed to it. Is it one of those things where it, it fell over a couple of days on either side? And... and indeed, it might have even taken place way later in winter, um, closer to perhaps where Christmas falls now. It's all part of this, the folkloric soup, you know. The rich traditions that run deep within this fair country. Back to Ronald Hutton, who explains that each mayor of Bristol in the 1470s was expected to entertain the whole council and prominent citizens and gentry to fires and their drinkings with spiced cake bread and sundry Ooh. wines before they dispersed to their respective parish churches for evensong. There, they presumably prepared for the most famous ritual of the night, ringing the church bells to comfort the souls in purgatory after the congregation had offered prayers for them. It must be said that belief in interacting with saints and souls was all rather Catholic stuff mm -hmm. that the Protestants were not too keen on. So, not everyone went along with this. Since All Saints Day was such a rip-roaring success after its invention in the 8th century, it was given a little double whammy wombo combo in the 10th century and got extended into All Souls Day on the 2nd of November. Perhaps the rabble wanted to think about their relatives that had passed on, and not just those fancy saints laughing it up in God's inner circle. You know that you really don't like the saints ever. Sometimes I'm just surprised by what I've written down. <laughs> uh, I'm particularly angry with writing this bit. I, w I was imagining the uh, the bishops and what have you being annoyed at the commoners for wanting. Uh, okay to make the day about themselves and not just the glory of God in heaven and all the saints living in it. In Catholic Ireland, candles would shine in the windows on the vigil of All Souls. And it was believed that the night of All Saints into the first hours of All Souls was the one night a year that the spirits of the dead would return to their homes. In the words of James Fraser in The Golden Bow, he does have a wonderful turn of phrase. He really does. They would warm themselves by the fire and comfort themselves with the good cheer provided for them in the kitchen or the parlour by their affectionate kinsfolk. He continues, It was perhaps a natural thought that the approach of winter would drive the poor, shivering, hungry ghosts from the bare fields and the leafless woodlands to the shelter of the cottage with its familiar fireside. And, I must say, it does feel remarkably similar to the idea of leaving out food and small offerings for the fairy folk that walk abroad at Samhain. Well, all this bell ringing and interacting with ghosts was a bit bloody much for the sensible, God-fearing Protestants. <laughs> <laughs> and in the draft of a letter which Henry VIII was to send to Cranmer against superstitious practices was written... The vigil and ringing of bells all night long upon All Hallow Day at night are directed to be abolished, and the vigil to have no watching or ringing. Although clearly it didn't work, and those damn papists kept their black magic business going, as in the early reign of Queen Elizabeth I, the following injunction was made, that the superfluous ringing of bells and the superstitious ringing of bells at All Hallow Tide and at All Souls Day, with the two nights before and after, be prohibited. I mean, I'm kind of with them. You just hate loud noises. Yes. They were having fun with the bells and shouting at ghosts. It was a good time. It doesn't sound like it's a good... What, what about the people just trying to sleep? Well, they should be contemplating the souls of their loved ones. They Screaming can... in agony in purgatory. They can do that while asleep. Mr. Neighbourhood Watch. I didn't actually <laughs> include it in the script, but I did come across a thing that was quite cool. That was describing um, the mass that would be held on... Uh, the, the, the eve of All Saints, the priest would dress all in black and Ooh. they'd have giant like black candles that would be lit while they're ringing the bells and oh, shouting wow. to the ghosts of all the souls. And um, I mean, honestly, I, I, you can kind of see how it looks a little bit bloody pagan. <laughs> yeah. That sounds metal as all fuck. Yeah. Once all that bloody solemnity was out of the way, thinking about saints, thinking about the dead, the main fun of All Souls Day was the practice of souling, which bears a distinct similarity to the modern Halloween tradition of trick-or-treating. This was particularly popular in the Midlands, where the poorer folk would go from parish to parish a souling, as they would call it, which involved begging and singing for any good thing that would make them merry, whether such things as apples and strong beer, obviously, 
can't oh, get okay. enough of apples yeah. and ales this time of year. Presumably to make a wassail bowl of lamb's wool. Hot spiced ale with roast apples in it. Do people, well, people know what wassailing is? <laughs> uh, possibly not, but I would suggest that that would be more for our Christmas oh, almanac. But the main prizes they were in search for... Gold. ...were soul cakes. Soul cakes. Yum, yum, yum. These spiced cake breads, or oat cakes, were generally baked by the richer folks of the community to hand out to crowds going souling. Brand, again, in observations on the vulgar customs of the kinsfolk, or whatever it's called, <laughs> mentions that the practice seems a remnant of popish superstition to pray for departed souls, particularly those of friends. Though these sweet treats were apparently so popular that the custom was even adopted by those dull old Reformation-loving Protestants. That part was written by me. Question. Yes. Soul cake duck. What's that? That's a joke from Terry Pratchett's books. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. <laughs> oh. Yes. Okay. The origin of these soul cakes may be the feasts that were laid out for the spirits of the departed to dine on, meaning that they are cakes for souls. <laughs> ha! Clement Miles suggests that they may even be vestiges of the sacrament made to the corn spirit in the pagan harvest festival, given the fact that they contain oats and corn and other such things. But they were flat, round, biscuity things, probably. Sometimes with oats in, sometimes with a bit of corn, sometimes just flour. Spiced, sometimes with raisins, and a cross would be made on the top, so they looked like a big cocoa mole. <laughs> <laughs> they sound tasty. They do sound very good. We're going to add that to our attempted feast on uh, on All Hallows Day. The antiquarian Thomas Pennant recorded a North Welsh tradition that on receiving soul cakes, the poor people used to pray to God to bless the next crop of wheat. Hence it being related to more of a harvesty pagan yes. tradition, potentially. Whether for God or grain, it was a cracking time to eat, drink, and be merry. God, I'm such a good writer. <laughs> that was fantastic. <laughs> and the tradition was particularly strong in Shropshire, where they would sing the following rhyme while going round. Soul, soul for a soul cake. I pray, good missus, a soul cake. An apple or pear, a plum or a cherry, any good thing to make us merry. One for Peter, two for Paul, three for him who made us all. Up with the kettle and down with the pan. Give us good arms and we'll be gone. That's a fantastic little song. Yes. I don't know what the tune is, no, I so I just shouted it. I think you got it. <laughs> I did also come across one <laughs> source talking about the, uh, the, the rhymes that they would make, and apparently the one from Staffordshire could not be put to print. <laughs> it didn't say what it was, but apparently the writer refused to include it. <laughs> I desperately wish I had yeah. access to it. Some of the souling songs, in fact, were almost identical to songs that wassailers sing at Christmas, in theme if not exact content, wishing good fortune and health in exchange for some sweet treats. Uh, here we come, a wassailing all on the leaves so green. Very good. The sweet treats were seen as a sign of good fortune, too. Brand mentions that it was formerly usual to keep a soul mass cake for good luck. Mr. Young, in his history of Whitby, says, A lady in Whitby has a soul mass loaf near a hundred years old. Good lord. And one can only imagine what it looks like. Um, putrid, surely. <laughs> Idiots. Then but again, they do look like quite a dry cake. Mostly dust at this point. It could have just solidified into a sort of a brick. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that lady, good on her. How did she die? She ate it. <laughs> That's an ingestion of 100-year-old soul cake. <laughs> we have the treats, but what of the tricks? You what? ask. Ask? You ask me a question. I'll tell you an answer. Ask me a question. What of the tricks? Good question. In addition to the custom of souling, in various areas throughout the UK, people would bring dressing up in crazy costumes into the door-to-door -door fun. This is another practice that seems to link pagan and Christian traditions. What are you? What are you this year? I'm a sexy evil papist. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> I'm going to be a sexy evil Protestant. <laughs> This often took place on Samhain Eve, when geysers would go around singing songs or reciting verses in exchange for food. 
An essay on porcine legends by William Hackett, <laughs> Esquire. <laughs> you fucking what? Uh, pig legends. Why don't we have this book? Ah, uh, it's actually only an essay in a longer book. Um, that is from the Journal of the Royal Society of Antiquaries of Ireland, Volume Two. I mean, published in a... approximately eighteen fifty-five, if memory serves. That sounds like an actually really handy book. It sounds very good. Yeah. Well, you're in luck, Jack, because it's on archive dog. William Hackett Esquire describes the folks of Ballycotton in Ireland that would dub themselves the messengers of Muck Olla, a deity or spirit of winter. And at the head of their procession would be a horse's skull on a pole, enveloped in a white sheet, which they called the White Mare, and was the master of proceedings. The geysers would tell the farmers what good would come to them if Muckola was appeased, and the misfortune that would accompany an insufficient gift of milk, butter, eggs, corn, or potatoes. The generous donations may have gone towards the Samhain feast, or as an offering to appease the she and the dead that walked the earth. Hackett does go on to suggest that the kind gifts may have been extracted by force. Good God. <laughs> that would be the misfortune. <laughs> I'm going to be honest with you, if like a new mafia rose up in the UK and they were headed by the skull of a horse, you know, I'm, I'm kind of into it. I should mention as well that it would always pretty much be the men of the town that yes. would go around doing these processions. So it's all the burliest blokes yeah. going from farmer's door to farmer's door. Beating up the farmers <laughs> and stealing their eggs and, eggs and butter. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Jesus. But on the other hand, it was to make a nice feast for everyone, potentially. You say that. How much of it do you reckon actually went into the feast? And how much of it do you reckon went into their larders? <laughs> it isn't written down, I cannot say. In Cheshire, a similar practice was observed on All Souls Day. Also closely resembling the Mary Luid, probably not a correct pronunciation, I'm terribly sorry, of Welsh wassail traditions. The Cheshire Old Hob is another horse's skull enveloped in a sheet and taken door to door by people singing begging rhymes, as well as a similarity to Marie Luid, which is most commonly associated with Christmas. There is a parallel to the German tradition of Schimmel, and is one of a few similar traditions that pop up across the country between October through to Christmas Tide. I promise you, for Christmas, oh yes, I'll buy your horse's skull on a pole. Please do. I want to see your horse's skull on a pole match. <laughs> <laughs> in some cases these animal skulls would sort of symbolically replace what would have been a sacrificial animal like a cow or pig that would have been taken from house to house in order to collect money from those who wanted a part as in I want to eat that pig as part of the feasts coming up so I'm going to give you some money towards it exactly fair's fair you want to see the horse that you're about to eat with a horse <laughs> I, was, I was still thinking about horses nah. on sticks Though as years have evolved, many of these customs simply see people donning animal costumes, such as masks, horns, ears and tails, and marching in procession. Perhaps was a little bit of an inspiration for all the animal masks that turn up in... The Wicker Man. The Wicker Man. It seems like a, a fairly common thing throughout um, fates and festivals and revelry to don animal masks and things. It's a bit of fun. Yeah. I love those rubber animal masks that you get these days from costume shops. Yeah, They're hilarious. Yeah, quite fun. As I mentioned before, guising was generally an activity for men to take part in. But in the southeast of Scotland, both men and women would take part. And, in a very outrageous turn for the olden days, would disguise themselves, hence guising, disguising, mm -hmm. with a little bit of cross-dressing. My goodness. In 1616, for example, there was a group of Yuletide geysers out and about, with men in women's headgear and coats, and women in doublet and breeks. Were well, women, like, subsequently burnt or something? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's pretty much the origin of going door to door, offering treats, or threatening with tricks, dressing up. It's rosy bloody Halloween. It is. It cracked the code, Mousy. But for now, we're going to park Halloween and go a little bit further ahead in time to the 5th of November, which is very closely linked to the Halloween season. We're going from guys to guy. Forks. Yeah, yeah. From feasts to forks. Oh, come on. Do your section. <laughs> I'm trying to join in. <laughs> if you make a pun, my natural
natural reaction is to, I want to make a pun. <laughs> <laughs> remember, remember, the 5th of November, for gunpowder treason and plot. I forgot. I know of no reason why the gunpowder treason should ever be forgot. Guy Fawkes, Guy Fawkes, t'was his intent to blow up the king and parliament. Three score barrels of powder below to prove old England's overthrow. By God's providence he was catched with a dark lantern and burning match. Holler boys, holler boys, let the bells ring. Holler boys, holler boys, God save the king. And what should we do with him? Burn him. That was fun. Yes. I can see why people like burning things yes. and people. There's <laughs> so much fire in all these traditions. Oh, there is. People can't get enough of it. But what was that? What was that poem about, dear Heather? <laughs> um, <laughs> it was. It was. It was about the gunpowder plot. Uh, 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 and V. And V for vendetta. <laughs> On the fire night, or Guy Fawkes night, is an English tradition that commemorates the foiling of an attempt in 1605 by a group of Catholic rebels to blow up the Houses of Parliament and kill King James I, thereby bringing Catholic rule back to the UK. Those damn papists. Sincere apologies to any Catholics listening. Like I like scepters. I like gold things. I like red things. I like paintings. Catholicism. Hey, I've been to the Vatican. It's awesome. Have you? Yeah. I went into Saint Saint the the big church, Saint Peter's. I think it's Saint Peter's, right? Saint Peter's Basilica. I, have no idea. I was going to go and see the Sistine Chapel, but it's quite a long queue. The story goes that a group of men led by Robert Catesby had been, by cover of night, loading barrels of gunpowder into the bowels of Parliament from a house that Catesby had rented across the Thames. Guy Fawkes, the hero of our tale? Yeah. A Yorkshireman, who had taken off to fight in the Spanish army, had been charged, due to his low standing and anonymity with parliamentarians, with looking after the gunpowder and eventually setting the fuse before taking off down the Thames. The plot was foiled when Lord Monteagle, one of the members of the King's Council, received an anonymous letter, likely from Francis Tresham, member of the plot, and brother-in-law of Lord Monteagle. Oh, that bloody so-and-so. He dipped his own team members in. In fairness, he he he, he sent Lord Monteagle an, anon- an anonymous letter warning him personally to stay away from Parliament on the opening, on the opening of the House of Lords. Well, obviously it was going to tell, wouldn't he? No, no guarantee of it. What was he thinking? So, on that night, security was sent down to to run a sweep of Parliament and found Guy Fawkes in the bowels of Parliament, guarding the gunpowder. Goo you. <laughs> Interestingly, it's very, very unlikely that even that in the event of him not being caught, much damage would have been done. There's likely not enough gunpowder to have blown up Parliament. And it'd been stored in such a way that, because it was effectively in the basement, it next got to damp. the Thames. Yeah, yeah it, it, it'd gone all damp. Oh, no. So, caught Guy Fawkes. Quick round of light torture. There's another interesting aside. When he got caught, Guy Fawkes gave his name as John Johnson. Incredible name coming up on the fly. What's your name, sir? John? John? Son? <laughs> <laughs> so it didn't take much torture, supposedly, according to letters. So yeah, following a round of torture and a quick trial, Fawkes and many of his co-conspirators were sentenced to death. Yikes. Uh, Robert Catsby, their leader, and some of the more prominent members were apprehended at Catesby's country home and were shot while trying to flee and as such never made it to trial. This is potentially the reason that quite harsh punishments were doled out to those who were caught. Because they almost got away a little bit easy just getting shot. Yeah. You had to appease the baying crowds, you know? People loved a public execution. It's believed that a couple of them were sentenced to be hung, drawn and quartered. One of the best public executions. Yes. That's a real show. One poor soul was sentenced to be dragged down a cobbled street, face down by horses. Horrendously brutal. That sounds horrid. Guy Fawkes, however. Because at least getting hanged is actually quite quick, isn't it? Yeah. Whereas just sort of getting beaten to death by cobbles. Well, not very quick. Actually, at the time, being hung wasn't quite such a precise science. Guy Fawkes, however, upon heading up to the gallows, as soon as the noose was placed around his neck, jumped off the uh, the gallows, thus snapping his neck, before a hangman got a chance to do it himself. Oh, he was just like, I'm taking my life into my own hands. He sounds like a real go-getter. He Yes. 
Yes, he does. And like, I respect that. From his humble beginnings as the son of a dressmaker to being hung for high treason. So, given that this was fairly easily caught, nothing really happened. The question is, why do we burn effigies of this treason of this treasonous papal Yorkshireman on November 5th? Because it's awesome. I mean, yes, pretty much. Honestly. <laughs> <laughs> it seems that November 5th was pretty much immediately taken up as a festive occasion, with anti-Catholic sermons being present, presented in church, and public feasting and drinking to the ill health of, Cap- of the Catholic King of Spain and the good health of King James I, along with bonfires and, of course, the burning of the guy. Well, since everyone was already doing bonfires this time of year anyway, and the Catholics were having all the fun with the bell ringing and the shouting at ghosts, I guess the Protestants wanted in on the fun. Yes. It just all kind of makes sense. There's an article from The Strand in 1863, so about 200 years after the fact, describing the activities as they would have been in the 1600s. Burning the figure of Guy Fawkes in Lincoln's Inn Fields near what at the time was the Duke of Newcastle's house, as many as 12 or 14 bonfires and guys thrown on between the hours of 6 and 12 at night. Cold blimey. Yeah. Uh, in 1606, a year after the, the failed attempt, Parliament recognised the day as a holiday forever in thankfulness to God for our deliverance and detestation of the Papists. <laughs> Horrendously anti-Catholic bent to this episode, and I feel quite bad about it. I'm pro-Catholic, I'm pro-Protestant, I'm pro-everyone, let's just have a good time. Everyone gets to set fire to things, okay? Yes. Wrong with Hutton describes how over time the practices became less about the life of the king and more just openly anti-Catholic. Due to the growth of of popular feeling against Catholicism during the 1670s, Londoners developed the tradition of parading effigies of the Pope and burning them at Temple Bar. As the years have gone by, and feelings of enmity towards Papists have mellowed, hopefully, in some areas. Apparently not from you. What? (laughs) <laughs> I, I'm, I, I love all creeds. Guy Fawkes Night has become more of a generalised celebration, although the burning of the guy is still a centrepiece for many communal events, with large-scale bonfire ceremonies, such as the one in Lewis, West Sussex, often placing a public figure, such as a politician, on the fire. I think recently we've seen, like, Trump has been a centrepiece. Yeah, there was a Theresa May one. Yeah, Johnson. They had to ban one of Cameron and a pig ah! a couple of years back. Which I think is hilarious. Bringing the pigs into it, actually quite folklorically relevant for the time of year as well. And of course, the old idea of the effigy, again, kind of draws back to the old uh, sacrifices occurring at the Samhain festivities as well. Yeah. Uh, These days, I suppose it's just like burning of a public figure as an act of ridicule, rather than saying, we want this person dead. Oh, yeah. So it's a bit of fun. Yeah. Yeah. Though not all communities celebrate November 5th in the same way. We're going to leave you today with two interesting variants from Devon. In the village of Shervar, at 8pm, bell ringers will let out, and I quote, a violently discordant peal of bells, and then, with the help of crowbars, turn over a large boulder they call the Devil's Stone in order to keep the village safe. While it's not known for how long the practice of the turning of the stone has been going on, there is a wealth of legends surrounding it and as to how it arrived. The stone itself is about six feet long, and it's said to weigh a ton. It's also worth pointing out that I'm reading right now mostly from the uh, Shearbars Village website. that had a beautiful piece on the Devil Stone. It is not from a local rock formation, and is in fact an erratic. That is, a stone from elsewhere, such as those deposited uh, during the Ice Age. One theory is it may have been an altar stone bought by a pagan cult, in the way that the Druids bought the stone from Wales to Stonehenge in Wiltshire. But there is no evidence for this. <laughs> I love the self-deprecation. Yes. <laughs> Another is it was dropped by the devil himself when he was cast out of heaven by St. Michael. Uh. Hence the clamour of discordant bells to frighten him away. Though, is there evidence of that? I was about to say, though there is no evidence. <laughs> Finally, there is a theory that it was quarried as the foundation stone for Hanscott Church nearby, and was moved to Shearbar by the devil or some supernatural force. But every time it was retrieved, it mysteriously turned up in Shearbar again. So, it was finally left there. He said... But the turning was neglected but once during the First World War, when misfortune immediately descended on the village. Again in 1940, when most able men were away, 
They failed to turn the stone, and the war news suddenly became so threatening that it is unlikely it won't be turned again in the future. Clearly this is weighing very heavily upon the <laughs> consciences of, of the residents of, of, of Shiba, given that it, they feel as though they brought on the disasters of war. Feels like they're being a bit harsh on themselves, right? Yeah. I mean, look, they, they tried their best. They couldn't turn the stone. It's not like they forgot about it. That would, of course, warrant the disasters of war. <laughs> <laughs> the last story we have today is just revelry, though. Oh, I love yes. revelry. 55 miles away from Shiba, the town of Otterley St. Mary has a different but equally peculiar and quite frankly rather terrifying tradition. Starting from one of the four pubs in town, the men of Otterley St. Mary will gather and will proceed to lift flaming barrels of tar over their heads and begin a race to the bonfire held in a nearby meadow. Any excuse to set some stuff on fire? Right, first of all, if you are near a computer, for the love of God, Google search... Otley St. Mary tar barrels. You'll it's get, a sight to behold. You'll get some real beautiful images. Screaming people with legit full barrels that are just burning. Resting on the back of their necks, just charging. Tradition dictates that the only men who are either born in the town or who have lived there most of their lives are allowed to carry the barrels. Tourists, women, children, fit or not, smaller barrels are available for women and children. Because, <laughs> let's be honest, Otley St. Mary... Progressing with the times. That's very kind of them, uh, having burning tar barrels <laughs> for the children. <laughs> you know, for kids. <laughs> While the origin of the practice has sadly been lost to time, the main theories suggest that it was A, a way of warding off evil spirits. Classic. B, part of the fumigation process for the cottages. Though I can't, I, I can't imagine that carrying burning tar into a cottage is going to make it smell any nicer than it does did before. No, but in the Samhain tradition, of course, people would bring yes. the brands into the home and the purifying smoke of the bonfire would bring good fortune. So perhaps it's a little bit of a callback to that. Yes, of course. Or simply a way of warning about the approach of the Spanish Armada. Like, I guess the idea was if you saw a ship in the distance, it was night, light a burning tar barrel and parade it around. Yeah, I, I can see that. You have a rudimentary and very stout lighthouse. <laughs> on top of a very burnt man yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go from cracking nuts to burning tar we've given you a good few options of fun frolics and activities that you can enjoy on the season of Samhain maybe not this year but you've got plenty of time to prepare a full week of feasts and Frankish traditions for the following year I mean I'll be honest with you running around with a Barrel of burning tar over your head is a good way to practice social distancing. That is a very good point. Who needs masks when you can just set yourself on fire? While it is a shame that this year we'll not be able to celebrate Halloween with our loved ones, the kids can't go trick-or-treating, the adults can't head to the pub or the club or whatever it is you're planning on doing, take solace while you're carving your pumpkin and watching the craft. You can have a drink of lamb's wool, you can cover your bed in lemons, and you can pray that no burly men brandishing horse skulls come and beat you up for your butter. That's as much as we can all hope for. With that, good night, folks. I've been a horse on a stick, Heather Morehouse. <laughs> I have been the seed that stayed on your cheek, Kieran Hill. Oh, that's nice. You are the seed that stayed on my cheek. I'm the seed that stayed on all of our listeners' cheeks, Heather. And good riddance to that seed that fell off. Yeah. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much for listening. We do hope you enjoyed our exploration on the customs and traditions and rites and rituals of Halloween, Samhain, All Saints and All Souls, and Bonfire Night, and indeed the first edition of the Gods and Goblins Almanac. So, until next time, why not connect with us on the social media? We are on mostly Twitter and Instagram at Gods and Goblins. Why not chat with us there? We're often having a good old time posting fun pictures of folkloric things. If you'd like to chat with us directly with any questions or concerns, you can send us an email mm -hmm. at godgobpod at gmail.com. And if you really enjoyed this, why not leave us a review on iTunes or Stitcher or wherever you listen to your podcasts? It not only makes us feel big and fresh as a blood sausage on Samhain, but it also helps our podcast out. 
and maybe we'll even push us up the rankings a little bit so that people can join our little clan of goblins. And have a happy Halloween. And a very super sour. Bye bye! Premarital Rumpy Pumpy, is that what they used to call it? As far as I know. How old do you think I am? Don't. You have mutton chops, I I am 28. You look like a Victorian pervert. I look like a Victorian butcher. Butchers are perverts. Man, what? They love that meat. Slapping that meat. Touching that meat. (laughs) Licking that meat. They just love the meat. (laughs) You think butchers lick their meat? I, I don't know what happens when when the doors are closed. Prying <laughs> eyes on there. When they're all alone in the hanging up the meat room. The butchers. No, like the back room where they hang up all the meat. Huh? They like hanging it up so it looks like a lady. <laughs> Lonely men butchers. Anyway, let's move on. <laughs> <laughs>